Hey, Paul, I'm excited to tell you that we are launching a Curbsiders Patreon. Have you heard about this? I I did because I work with you, but tell me more about it. (laughs) All right, Paul. Well, we want to be able to keep offering this great free content. And we're doing things like upgrading our website. We offer transcripts now for episodes, recording new seasons of our mini series, Teach and Addiction Medicine. The Digest is growing its staff. And Paul, now we're on video. People can see us uh, as we're talking right here. What a treat for our listeners. That's right. So with Cashlack admitting privileges, they're going to get all episodes ad free that's the whole back catalog plus future episodes and twice monthly there's going to be bonus episodes where me and you recap a show and answer some listener questions so people should sign up today at patreon.com slash curbsiders and uh, you get a whole lot of more of Paul America's PCP <laughs> So excited to record tonight, and Zena, we're excited to have you here. How how are you? I'm doing well. Just waking up. I'm coming off of ICU nights and starting my my day off. That's the energy that we need for this show. Yeah. You know, there's nothing better than a long nap during the day and waking up to to learn and talk about addiction medicine. There's nothing I love more. And on that note, welcome back to the Curbsiders Addiction Medicine, our mini series on substance use disorders. I'm Dr. Carolyn Chan, and today I am joined by my co-host and an individual who helped produce our other episodes, Dr. Zena Huxley-Riker. And on today's episode, we're actually going to be talking inpatient management of alcohol withdrawal with the one and only Dr. Sean Cohen, who many of you know and are familiar with, who frequently co-hosts episodes with this. But before we get too much into this uh, as you know, will you remind the audience what we do on the show? Of course, Carolyn. We are the addiction medicine podcast that uses expert interviews to demystify the common addiction medicine topics, reduce stigma, and inspire listeners to be fierce advocates for all individuals who use substances. And a reminder that most episodes are available for free CME through credit through VCU Health CE for all health professionals at curbsauditors.vcuhealth.org. All you have to do is create an account. And per usual, special thanks to the American College of Academic Addiction Medicine, also known as ACAM, and they've really partnered with us to help support the Curbsiders Addiction Med Series. ACAM is the proud home of academic addiction med faculty and trainees, and they are dedicated to training and supporting the next generation of academic addiction med leaders. Visit their website at ACAM to learn more about the organization. And whether you're an addiction med doc preparing for the ABPM board exam or a clinician in practice who just wants to learn more about the addiction medicine field. ACAM offers several several self-study products that would help meet your needs. The professional practice bundle includes access to 86 self-assessment modules that provide CME as well as 46 didactic lecture recordings. And ACAM's board prep bundle also offers access to the 46 didactic lecture recordings along with a nearly 200 item question bank and its addiction e-practice test. So to learn more about these and other products that they offer, be sure to check out acam.org. Tonight, we have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. Sean Cohen, who is a hospitalist turned addiction medicine physician working on an inpatient addiction medicine consult service in New Haven, Connecticut. He's interested in making the hospital a more person-centered and less terrible place for people who use drugs. In our episode tonight, he teaches us briefly about the pathophys of alcohol withdrawal, a very simplified version, and breaks down treatment options with benzos and phenobarbital and more, and helps us understand the nuances between the various evidence-based treatments out there. A truly don't miss episode. And yes, and Zena, uh, I think this is the first time we have had you on air. So do you mind actually just telling the audience a little bit about yourself and giving us a one-liner? Of course. Um, so I am a current addiction medicine fellow at Montefiore, and I've been known to spend way too many hours in the kitchen baking cakes for my friend's birthdays. It's really all you need to know. What's the most? Uh, no, I need to know more. What's the most elaborate cake you've ever made? Um, my roommate in residency requested a Oreo cheesecake red velvet combination. And so I wow. put a cheesecake in the middle of red velvet cake and It was very wobbly and maybe ill-advised, but it tasted very delicious. (laughs) There's nothing ill-advised if it tastes good. Like, wobbly, you can overcome. Yeah. Transporting it was very difficult, and I may have lost a few years of my life, but we made it. (laughs) (laughs) And on that note, uh, let's jump to the show. 
Hey, Sean, uh, we're so excited to have you here today and we are turning the tables. So instead of co-hosting, you are going to be our guest expert. Yeah, it seems inappropriate, but thanks for having me. <laughs> Always, uh, you know, per, per, the, per the norm, we're going to start off with a case from Cashlack Memorial. So Zena, do you mind kicking off the case? Yeah, of course. Um, all right. So our first case, uh, Mr. A is a 53-year-old, has a history of hypertension, diabetes, depression, as well as a significant history of alcohol use. He's seen frequently in your hospital emergency room with over 10 admissions in the past year for alcohol withdrawal syndrome, one of which required ICU level management. He's admitted and you are the hospitalist caring for the, his alcohol withdrawal. His last CUA score recorded in the ED was 10. And when you just want to check on him, it was up to 16. He was given one milligram of IV lorazepam and five milligrams of IV diazepam while he was in the ED. So I think the first thing, Sean, that would be great is if you could explain to us kind of the pathophysiology of alcohol withdrawal, like what's going on here. I think this is evidence-based, but a little bit of expert opinion. This is like the simplified, dumbed-down version of neurobiology because I am terrible at neurobio, and this is the way that helps me remember why is alcohol withdrawal happen, what's the cause of it, and it kind of leads you into how do you treat it. And so I think really basically as your brain as a seesaw or a scales or some some sort of balance between your your inhibitory neurotransmitters and that's predominantly GABA and then your excitatory neurotransmitters and that's predominantly glutamate. Um, and alcohol in a simplified sense is really just GABA. It acts on the GABA receptor. It over, over GABAs, it over inhibits your brain, right? That's why if you drink too much alcohol, you start to stumble around. If you keep drinking, you eventually pass out. Uh, and most people that are just intermittently drinking or say like drinking on the weekends or after they've finished a week of working as a hospitalist because it's very stressful, um, they just go back and forth between being a little extra inhibited and kind of back towards their baseline of that balance between the GABA and glutamate. But if you're drinking a large amount, uh, and it's not really clearly defined what that is, but some people think around four drinks or more. And if you're drinking that over a long period of time, which is usually probably like two weeks or more, um, your body eventually says, hey, I don't like feeling inhibited all the time. Like I need to get back into balance. And so your body both down titrates your internal GABA system to balance out the extra GABA from the alcohol and up titrates your glutamate system. And now you're back in balance, right? But when you run out of alcohol because you get admitted to the hospital or you run out of money at the end of the month or something else happens, now the, the scales get flipped because you run out of the alcohol. Your internal GABA system isn't working and this glutamate system is all super amped up. And so now you have too little inhibition and too, little, too much excitation. And so you get overstimulated and you get all the symptoms of overexcitation that is alcohol withdrawal. That was, I said it was simplified, but that was probably a very long explanation, but I hope let me see if I get, Let me see if I can summarize it. So essentially alcohol withdrawal, it's kind of like having a seesaw. So on one side is the GABA, which is the in inhibitory. And the other side is glutamate, which is the excitatory. And over time, your body can adjust to the alcohol, which sort of kind of tips, uh, wants the seesaw to tip to one side. So your body adjusts. But over time, because um, your body has adjusted to this state, if you pull off the alcohol, the seesaw then is out of whack. And this can cause folks to have symptoms like seizures. Yeah, seizures and all the other stuff that I'm sure we'll get into of just overexcitation, tremors, the kind of mild stuff we see, and then the scary stuff like seizures and delirium tremens. And I'm curious too, can you tell us a little bit about what this alcohol kindling effect is? I don't think I learned about it till I was actually in fellowship. Yeah, I think it's, so it's, a, it's kind of like this phenomenon that's been written about a lot, but it, it basically, it says that the more episodes of alcohol withdrawal that you have, and particularly ones that aren't treated, the worse your alcohol withdrawal is going to get. And so there's this thought that like, when you have alcohol withdrawal episodes, that it somehow leads to more changes and worsening withdrawal further on. And so it's kind of, it's just, it's it's a important thing to remember because it basically is telling you that if someone's had bad withdrawal previously, that they're probably going to have bad withdrawal again. And so that's someone that you want to be more aggressive with treatment and have your ears poked up that things could become more severe. Awesome. That was super helpful. I think I, I feel like I have heard a lot of lectures on alcohol withdrawal, but I don't think I've like really <laughs> um, had like that 
simplified um, explanation of kind of the the balance of things. So thank you for that, John. Um, I guess kind of going back to our case and thinking about like this diagnosis of alcohol withdrawal syndrome, like how do you actually make that diagnosis and um, what are the some of, some of the like clinical tools that we can use to do that? Yeah. And I appreciate you saying you would, I thought I made up this like seesaw thing, by the way. And then I like looked in the principles of ASAM and it's in there too. And now I'm like, did I make it up or did I see it in this <laughs> book? And I just thought I made it up. So I'm very confused, but props to the people who wrote the principles of ASAM chapter on this. But um, so alcohol, there is, I think, a DSM-5 diagnosis and like requires all these specific things. I'll say like I diagnose alcohol withdrawal a lot and I've haven't really read the DSM-5 diagnosis. Um, I think like for me, alcohol withdrawal is, di is a clinical diagnosis, right? It is the diagnosis of you have hopefully history, if you're able to get it, of someone that has had regular drinking. Um, and then they're starting to have symptoms that are consistent with alcohol withdrawal. And those symptoms that we're thinking of for kind of the more mild or moderate withdrawal are things like tremor, agitation, diaphoresis, nausea, um, tongue fasciculations, you can see nystagmus. Um, for more severe, you're thinking of seizures or delirium tremens, which is both delirium and kind of autonomic hyperactivity, so hypertension, tachycardia. Um, there are a lot of different scales that we use, and, and those scales, I want to say, are not diagnostic, right? SIWA, the MINES, the BAWS, the AWS, whatever other three or four letter acronym you can come up with are not diagnostic scales. They are they're basically trying to gauge the severity of how, of how bad someone's symptoms of alcohol withdrawal to gauge treatment based on their severity. And so they're not, they're not incredibly, I mean, they're not super specific, right? You can have a high, and maybe we'll talk about this later, but you can have a high CWA score from lots of things. And so it is not a diagnostic tool. It is, it is a clinical tool that we can use to help treat alcohol withdrawal. Okay, that's helpful. I feel like um, I often see people like talk about, well, their CWA score isn't elevated, so they're not having alcohol withdrawal or like something like that. And so I think it's a good reminder to think about that as a, once we've made the clinical diagnosis to then use that as a tool to direct our treatment and therapy. Yeah. And for those of you who may be unfamiliar, the CWA score stands for the Clinical Institute, I don't know, the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment, maybe. Those are the li right letters, but are they the right words? I'm not sure, but that's what I'm going to go with. <laughs> yeah, the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment for Alcohol Scale. Oh, so, man, now I look job, like I really Sean. know my stuff. <laughs> Commonly referred to as the CWA scale. The CWA score. Um, but I think, again, that's probably the one I've seen most commonly used in hospitals. Do you see anything else used in ICU settings that folks may be able to reference? And, and this is something that we'll kind of get through throughout, but like most of alcohol withdrawal is uh, the management of it is very uh, institution dependent. And so like there are these big principles of treatment that definitely are evidence based and I think should guide your management. But the details are less evidence based and are very institutional dependent. And that includes which symptom score you use. And so like I agree with you, CWA, and specifically CWA AR, which I think is like a, sh a slightly shorter revised one for alcohol, um, is is probably the most commonly used scale. But there's other ones in, in ICUs all over or on the floors that are used like the the mines and it's like the Minnesota something detox score. I, I don't know what the I and the N stand for, but <laughs> I think that one ha relies a little bit more on uh, blood pressure and and tachycardia, so some like objective findings, and is sometimes using the ICU. The RAS, the Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale, which is used often to gauge sedation for for patients that are intubated too. There's a little bit of data in using that for for alcohol withdrawal as well. And I honestly am sure there's like a, a bunch more that I am. Someone's going to get mad at me because they came up with this validated scale that I'm not calling out now. But I'm sure there's a ton more, and I apologize to anybody whose scale I forgot. And to your point, like, a tool is only as good as the people who are around you who feel comfortable in using it, you know? So yeah. use what your institution prefers, what your nurses are trained on, uh, because that matters for implementation, which we'll, we'll probably talk about a little bit later. But I'm also curious, like, 
Can you tell us a little bit more? Like, what are the most serious complications of alcohol withdrawal? You know, you're a hospitalist. When, uh, what are you nervous about? What are you trying to sort of prevent? Yeah, and that it's a great question because the tr- I think we, when we work in the hospital, we have this idea that like severe, scary alcohol withdrawal, and, and I'll say like the, what severe alcohol withdrawal is defined completely variably in the literature. But in my brain, severe alcohol withdrawal Scary alcohol withdrawal is like the the complications that can lead to morbidity and mortality. And so those are seizures, alcohol withdrawal seizures, and delirium tremens. Uh, And the way that delirium tremens leads to mortality is predominantly through arrhythmias. And so, and and getting back to a little bit to the pathophysiology, I think of like the the mild or moderate symptoms, like the tremor, the diaphoresis, those things as being predominantly from too little GABA, too little inhibition. And like the scary, scary symptoms, seizures, uh, delirium tremens as being from too much glutamate, like that over amping of your system. And the glutamate leads to, again, very simplified. I'm not an expert on this, but the excess glutamate leads to excess dopamine, which leads to like delirium, right? That's what. And then the excess glutamate also leads to like excess catecholamines, norepi and epi. And that leads to um, kind of hypertension, tachycardia, this autonomic hyperactivity. And I'll say that delirium tremens and alcohol withdrawal seizures are not super common, right? This happens in less than 5% of alcohol withdrawal, but they are scary. And in the hospital, we're probably treating a population that's enriched for people that are at risk for this. And so we really need to be on the lookout for these things and, and making sure if, if this is happening or we're worried it's happening, that we're treating more aggressively. I guess kind of building off of... Um these scales and like understanding severity. I think something that I as a resident come up against a lot all the time right now is like the triage of a patient and like where, where they go and where's the best place for them to be managed. So how do you kind of think through, um, that and, uh, figure out who needs to be admitted first of all. And then once they are admitted, like where they go in the hospital, who goes to the ICU versus the floor? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, great question. Cause it, I mean, it's good to know all this pathophys and like what the complications are, but if we don't know who's going to get the complications and who we need to be worried about, right, it's it's almost useless information. And so um, I, I want to put a plug in for, I think it was the second episode of the first season of this series with with Steve Holt, where you can hear both about, I think, his bird watching, if I remember correctly, but also about how to do outpatient alcohol withdrawal management or ambulatory alcohol withdrawal management, which is an incredible skill. And they talk a lot in that episode about triage. Um, And so I think that the outpatient versus hospital, whether someone needs to be admitted is often, have they had complications before? Do they have other comorbidities? Are they willing to be hospitalized? But I think go to that episode if you really want the details. But if someone is getting admitted to the hospital, the looking at like who is going to who is going to develop severe alcohol withdrawal is something that like a lot of observational studies have looked at and the data is kind of all over the place um but i think the things that ring true from lots of different studies but also ring true to my personal experience um is that the people that are at highest risk for having s- complicated alcohol withdrawal scary alcohol withdrawal and again that's just to emphasize that seizures and delirium tremens and maybe needing icu care are people that unsurprisingly have had complicated or scary alcohol withdrawal before. And so that's people that have had seizures or delirium tremens recently. That's people that are getting admitted for alcohol withdrawal seizures, because it's worth noting alcohol withdrawal seizures peak within 24 hours of your last drink. And so like people often present with a seizure. And if they do, those people are at high risk and should be treated more aggressively and like, like they are at high risk for having more seizures and delirium tremens. Um, and then the other things I, I, other kind of data that I look at are, does, is someone already having pretty significant alcohol withdrawal symptoms and they have a, still a positive blood alcohol level because things are probably going to get worse as, as the kind of alcohol gets out of their body? Um, and then is someone really sick from something else? Are they getting admitted because they're like severely ill from something else? And we just don't think that there's, they would tolerate severe alcohol withdrawal and, or even the risk of it. Those are the people that I'm most worried about and want to be a little bit more aggressive with treatment up front. So what are the medication treatment options for the management of inpatient alcohol withdrawal? Yeah. So, so, and I, and I kind of, I, I'm always going back to this, my very broken model of pathophysiology, but I thinking about kind of 
The main problem of alcohol withdrawal is too little GABA, right? The, the treatments of alcohol withdrawal are predominantly giving people GABA back so that they don't, don't have this abrupt drop in GABA when the alcohol goes away. And so the most evidence-based treatment for alcohol withdrawal is benzodiazepines. And so that's kind of classically, I think we think about like diazepam as a longer acting, but rapid onset. That's honestly my preference in benzodiazepines. Um, and it predominantly works by activating the GABA receptor. Um, there is, there is the, the alternative medications that we can use are other medications that also work on the GABA receptor. So there's like a little data for gabapentin, although I think more in the outpatient setting. But I think the other medication that's really gaining a lot of prominence recently, and I think is being used more and more, particularly in the setting of severe or scary alcohol withdrawal, is phenobarbital. And, and that the reason why is phenobarbital works both on the GABA receptors, but in a different way than the benzodiazepines that some people think maybe mitigates cross tolerance with alcohol, but it's also a glutamate antagonist. So it works on that other end of the seesaw that we were talking about that we think maybe is more responsible for this, for seizures and DTs, the scary aspects of alcohol withdrawal. I also have to ask, I'm just curious, do you um, give thymine for all these patients or use additional adjuncts to help with their symptoms? Yeah. Uh, Thymine, yes, 100%. So I think uh, the new ASAM guidelines, too, I, I, I should put a plug in. Like there's a new, or maybe they're not new now. It shows my age. I think they came out in 2020. But there's an ASAM alcohol withdrawal guidelines that do a pretty good job of going into a lot of this stuff, or it's a pretty thick packet, but um, it's worth taking a look at considering alcohol withdrawal is so incredibly common when we when we in the hospital. But um, it recommends thymine for everybody, and I agree with that. And I think it's particularly worth noting people – Alcohol withdrawal and uh, the gastritis that alcohol causes, there's a thought that people aren't able to absorb PO thiamine, and that's maybe the reason why some people are deficient. And so I, I say, if you're in the hospital and you have an IV, you should be getting IV thiamine. And then it's worth putting a plug in that like Wernicke's is incredibly common, Wernicke's encephalopathy. And that's, again, from a thiamine deficiency. The big three things we think about are like oculomotor disturbances, altered mental status, and abnormal gait. Um, you don't need all three to make the diagnosis. And there's some data that even people that only have one of the three, they still have a relatively high risk for Wernicke's. And so if you have any concern, so someone is looking malnourished, has an unstable gait, is altered, or something weird's going on with their eyes, they should get higher dose thymine. And that's 200 to 500 milligrams IVQ8 to treat Wernicke's. Other people can just get 100 daily as kind of a prophylaxis for Wernicke's um, while they're in the hospital. I will plug that, though I, I personally don't discharge people on thiamine, I think we really should be prioritizing like medications that have proven benefit in the outpatient setting. And another plug that I should make is like alcohol withdrawal is a symptom of alcohol use disorder, right? It's a symptom of a disease. And so we should be addressing their alcohol use disorder when they're getting admitted for withdrawal. And that includes offering medications. So if I'm going to prioritize giving medications to people, it's going to really be MAUD, like meds for alcohol use disorder over over outpatient oral vitamins. That makes sense. Um, I guess going back to the kind of the inpatient setting and thinking about these different treatment options, um, do you have any, and I know you kind of mentioned that a lot of this is institution dependent, but do you have any pre tips or preferences in terms of how to decide which benzodiazepine to use and whether you're giving IV versus PO and kind of all of those different decision branch points? Yeah. Yeah, I think, and, and I'll say, yes, very institution dependent. I'll tell you that the hospital I used to work at was, it wasn't even, it was even beyond institution dependent. It was like, uh, uh, like where you were in the hospital dependent. Like the ED only used diazepam, the floor only used chlordiazepoxide or lorazepam, and then the ICU started using phenobarb. So depending on what floor you were on, you were getting different treatment for alcohol withdrawal no matter where. So um, I think there are a couple principles that I think we can, again, literature is all over the place, mostly because you're comparing a protocol to another protocol, but every hospital's protocol is different. So like every study is comparing different things. Um, but I think the things you can glean are, particularly for benzodiazepines, which again, I think predominantly are our first line treatment because they have the wealth of the data that they reduce delirium tremens, that they improve symptoms, um, are long acting benzos are preferred to short acting benzodiazepines. In my mind, the 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 easiest benzodiazepine to use is diazepam 
uh, because it's available as IV, PO, and can be given IM. Um, it is very rapid onset. So onset of, of kind of its effect is within 15 minutes and it has active metabolites. And so it lasts in your body for day, hours, days, so that you don't, you get less of this roller coaster ride than you do with short acting benzos where it's like the benzo works, but now it's out of your system. And then you get more benzo and then it's out of your system. And so unless someone has severe liver disease where they have like hepatic dysfunction, they can't metabolize, I'm worried they're not metabolizing drugs normally, I'm using long acting and I'm using diazepam generally. Um, the IV to PO is I think like really how it, it, it's going to be protocol dependent, I think, on some hospitals like use mostly IV, some use mostly PO, some it's dependent on your CWA score. I mean, I think it's really about like how quickly you need your 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 diaz your benzodiazepine to work. And so like if people look like they're going in the wrong direction, if their whatever symptom scale you're using is very high, I think I would lean more on the IV. I think if you're using something just maintain them or their CWA scores are elevated, but not super high or whatever symptom score you're using, then I think maybe using a little bit more PO. Um, I think that is, mm, I don't know if there's any other points I want to make. I, I guess just so. to, you kind maybe of hinted at me a question and I'll remember. Yeah, you hinted at this, um, you kind of mentioned hepatic impairment and like liver function. Um, but I, uh, you know, I think this is something we cover a lot in medical school and talking about the different benzodiazepines and which ones are hepatically cleared versus not. Um, so if you could just kind of refresh like what the choice would be yeah. if you if we're avoiding diazepam, for example. Um, so it's oxazepam, temazepam, and lorazepam. And, um, and so personally for me, most people I'm going diazepam. If they have really severe liver dysfunction, I'm going lorazepam. Um, but I'm not, I don't, Again, like it's going to be what's on your formulary at your hospital and things like that. Chlorodized epoxide is often a longer acting benzo, but only available orally. Um, but th that's my branch point, really. And I will say, too, in my clinical pr practice, if we have a patient who does have liver disease, but their CWAs are just getting worse, you know, they're getting sick, you know, they're really not responding well, I will still use IV diazepam just because the time to onset is really short. And I have not had a ton, honestly, I, those patients who are really sick and need it, I haven't seen any issues, I think, really with like over treating them just because their their need and their benzo tolerance is so high. So I definitely think it's a clinical judgment for sure, you know, so um, use with caution, but also if you have to use it, I think don't be afraid to use it, particularly with all the drug shortages we've seen, I think in the COVID era, you may not have, be able to access, you know, lorazepam. Um, my follow-up question yeah. to this, though, is too, is like the next branch point, right? After we kind of choose like what which benzodiazepine, I think most hospitals may have a fixed benzodiazepine protocol where essentially, you know, we're just going to give you this amount every couple of hours. For some people, use symptom triggered where they're monitoring, you know, the COAR and just giving medications based on symptoms, how do you decide, you know, which person should be placed on which protocol? Are there benefits to one over the other? Yeah. So I think there's enough enough data to support. I, I, I'll say like a lot of the early data was is not in the hospital. It's it's in other like kind of more like either medically managed withdrawal centers and places like that. But I think there's enough data to suggest, and, and it shouldn't be a surprising finding, right, that a symptom-triggered treatment, and that's giving people the medication based on the how how severe their symptoms are withdrawal generally using a symptom scale like the CWA generally it results in people getting less benzodiazepines and having a shorter length of stay probably because you're treating them based on their symptoms and not just giving everybody the same thing um there's like a really uh landmark article i think in like the 90s in maybe the new england journal of medicine that we can reference in the notes but um, that really showed the, a profound difference in the amount of benzodiazepines people got in their length of stays by using symptom-triggered treatment. So so my my kind of principles of how do I use benzodiazepines when someone's coming in with alcohol withdrawal are, one, make sure your hospital has a protocol, right? Like, there's ample evidence showing that, like, people, everybody just doing whatever they want in the hospital is worse than having a standard protocol where you have kind of a symptom-triggered therapy and everybody in the hospital is doing the same thing. Like, that clearly improves care. Two is um, 
I'm doing this triage that we kind of talked about is like, how worried am I that someone is going to get sick, sick from alcohol withdrawal? And that's again, seizures or delirium tremens. And so my, uh, I'm asking people when I see them, have they come in with a seizure? Do they have a history recently of alcohol withdrawal seizures or delirium tremens? Are they really sick from something else? Is there some other thing that I'm worried about that if they go into bad alcohol withdrawal, that they're not going to be able to tolerate it? If they're, if they're low risk from that perspective, I'm just sticking with symptom-triggered benzodiazepines. If they're high risk from that perspective, I'm either treating them with like front-loading benzodiazepines, which is like giving a bunch of doses up front of benzodiazepines based, usually often based on their symptoms, but that's like diazepam, 10 milligrams every 15 minutes, as long as their CWA score is high for like two hours or something like that, and then putting them on symptom-triggered. Or I'm putting them on a fixed dose, and so that's like for instance, diazepam 10Q6, and also giving them symptom-triggered therapy, um, and then only tapering the fixed dose when they're they're not requiring symptom-triggered therapy anymore. And the reason for that is like you wanna you're worried that this person's gonna go into severe alcohol withdrawal, so you don't want them to have no benzos in their system. You want them to have some GABA all the time. I think the big alternative for people that are high risk is is phenobarb, right? Is that what we talked about? Phenobarb maybe treating both the GABA receptor in a different way, but also being a glutamate antagonist for these people that are at really high risk, is there some benefit to giving phenobarb instead of benzodiazepines? And I think overall, the jury is kind of still out. I think there's a lot of people moving towards using phenobarb, particularly as like monotherapy. And that means like when they hit the door in the ED, if they're high risk, or if they have severe withdrawal when they hit the door, or they've gotten only a little bit of benzodiazepines, giving them a big dose of phenobarb, that's like 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram often in divided doses, getting that phenobarb level up in their blood and then giving them a taper that just keeps the phenobarb level in their blood the same for five days and gets them through the withdrawal period. And there's some data that shows maybe it's similar to benzos and outcomes. There's like some data that shows that when ICUs have switched to phenobarb from a benzodiazepine, that they have maybe have reduced intubations. And, and there was a, a good like mixed method studies where qualitatively both patients and nurses and clinicians liked phenobarb better because it was just easier to manage for everybody. Um, so I think if your hospital allows you to use phenobarb, if it's like something that's regularly being used, like I've had a lot of success with it. And I think the literature is showing more success, particularly for people that are higher risk for, for severe withdrawal. That was a mouthful though. And to your point, it's so long acting, something with symptom trigger that can be challenging is nurses are extraordinarily busy, right? And they play a huge role in sort of implementing that if somebody else on the floor gets sick and they have to go to a rapid and it could potentially, unfortunately, you know, it may delay the noticing that someone's CWA score is, you know, increasing. And so I can definitely imagine there could be like very practical benefits, you know, from that standpoint. But I think this leads to the great point in our next case. So our patient, we have given him a total of 50 milligram IV diazepam in the past hour. So he's gotten a hefty dose, yet the CUA AR has continued to climb. It's up to 24. And right now you go check on him and he's having visual hallucinations and responding to an internal stimuli. And you decide, hey, like this is kind of like a delirium tremens type picture. Um, so I think my first question for you is, is what is benzodiazepine resistant alcohol withdrawal? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a great question because it doesn't have an answer. Uh, <laughs> that's so why I, I like to ask questions that have no answer, Sean. <laughs> yeah, I love to answer questions that have no answer. So um, benzodiazepine resistant alcohol withdrawal is 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 this idea, right? That like, and it's kind of what, what I mentioned a little earlier is that like some people benzos just don't work as well. And the thought is that maybe there's like this cross tolerance with alcohol with and benzodiazepines where it just doesn't work as much, um, where you just would need like crazy high doses to actually have an effect. And so there's like some literature that says it's like 40 milligrams of diazepam equivalents in an hour. There's like some that it's like, I think something similar, but like 200 milligrams of diazepam equivalents in five hours. But it's like, it's not like most of the alcohol withdrawal literature, there's not like good consistent definitions, unfortunately. Same with like, again, what severe withdrawal or complicated withdrawal is. I mean, a lot of this is going to be kind of gut, which kind of stinks and is expert opinion. But I feel like if I'm giving someone benzodiazepines, diazepam, it's they've gotten a couple doses of the diazepam in a couple hours, their CY score is not downtrending. 
that's when I'm thinking about switching them over to phenobarb or thinking of how do I augment their care at this point to, to more aggressively treat their alcohol withdrawal. I guess to that point, um, just thinking about kind of these like acute moments where, you know, you get called by the nurse, the patient is like escalating quickly, um, kind of making those decisions. Like, you know, I know you mentioned the switching to phenobar, but like what are some of the other tools and strategies in that patient who's like escalating really quickly um, to address their like worsening alcohol withdrawal syndrome? The option, unfortunately, what, what it really comes down to is the options are what's what, where is your patient currently? Like where in the hospital are they? Are they in the ICU? Are they in the, the floor? Are they in the ED? And what is available in that location? Because unfortunately, or fortunately, right, there's regulation or there's like hospital specific guidelines on like what treatments can be given where. And so I can't give like guidance that fits for everybody because unfortunately, like every hospital is a little different, but I'll tell you what I do. And so like, if I'm giving someone diazepam and they're not responding to diazepam and I given them like say 50 milligrams in the last couple of hours and they're still not responding and there's their symptom triggered scores are going up and they look like like they're getting hypertensive they're getting tachycardic i'm worried that they're impending going into dts or about to seize or something i'm either going to be like very aggressive with giving benzo more benzodiazepines and so that's like giving them every 15 minutes for a while until we can get them well controlled but i'm more likely to just say like i just am worried that benzos aren't going to work right now and so i want to switch therapies to something different and so and that's where I really think about phenobarbital is thinking about like, is there this medication that works a little bit differently on the GABA receptor and also works on the glutamate receptor? Might this have a different effect? And so, again, it's going to be a little hospital specific. Like the hospital I used to work at, we could give someone who's gotten benzodiazepines could get 130 milligrams of phenobarbital on the floor. If they didn't respond, they could get another dose. And then if they didn't respond to that, they went to the ICU. The hospital that I currently work at, it's they can get two doses of 65. And if they don't respond to that, they go to the ICU or the step down unit. And those I think are kind of, I think of those as kind of quote unquote rescue doses. And so those are like, someone's on their benzodiazepine treatment. Let's see if we can get them doing better with a little bit of phenobarb. And if they do, maybe continue their benzo treatment. And if they don't, we got to shift the things to phenobarb entirely. And they have to go to like probably a step down unit or an ICU to get these big, again, 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram doses of phenobarb. And so that's equivalent like in a 70 kilo person, and this is ideal body weight, it's worth noting, but that's like 700 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams of phenobarb in divided doses. So these are big doses. And so generally people that are getting this loading therapy with phenobarb, where you're only going to use phenobarb after that to treat alcohol withdrawal, is going to be in a place where someone can be more closely monitored, like the emergency department or the step-down unit or the ICU. And are there specific things that you're worried about with those high doses of phenobarb? I mean, it's mostly sedation, to be honest. There's like, I think when people get uh, the IV uh, pushes of phenobarb, there's like a, an acute risk of hypotension, which I think is often what people are monitoring in the ICU and the step-down unit for. Um, I think that's less so if they're given IM or PO. I think there are some protocols where they do these loads PO or IM too. Um, but I think the big thing you're worried about is is sedation mostly. But I think also when you have this person that's floridly going into withdrawal, like it's it's going to be hard to honestly sedate them probably. And so, um, but but those are the things you're monitoring for. And I think too, just to raise a point that you said earlier, right, is there is kind of like a wide range of doses you can give for phenobarb that's clearly institutional dependent. I think in my practice, I have tended to see like if somebody's already gotten a, a decent dose of benzodiazepines, um, I'm already thinking about not using that huge, what was it, like the 10, the 10 meg to 15 per meg per cake for pheno, phenobarb, and I'm thinking about dose reducing that a little bit. Um, do you do that in your practice? I guess you have to if your institution requires it, but do you see that frequently? Yeah. I mean, I'll say like a lot of the ICU studies, and there was this one, the the like the mixed method study, I think came out of BU recently. That's a pretty good, that I'll make sure I send, send everybody's way. But um, I don't think that they had a limit before they loaded people with phenobarb and how much benzos people got. Um, that being said, like when you're mixing benzodiazepines and phenobarb, right, you're mixing respiratory depressants. And so like there is some risk of respiratory depression. Um, but I, I think the cutoff is kind of, I think, and this is, I think, part of the reason why people do do these loads, not just as a one-time slug of like 10 to 15 milks per kg, but some often do them as like three doses of a third of whatever dose you're giving them. So, um, 
So I think there are people that dose reduce. There's, uh, there's risks both ways, right? If you underdose someone, are they are you not going to treat their withdrawal? If you give them too much, are they going to be sedated for a long time? And so I'll say like when people are getting a ton of benzos, like I'm, am I watching them after they get part of this load a little bit more closely to see if they need the whole load? Yes. But I think I'm still probably giving them in the like 10 mg per kg range at least because that's kind of where most of the data is. So our patient, he ends up going to the ICU um, and gets loaded with phenobarb and overall is stabilized in the ICU. And there's a protocol and he has started on a phenobarb taper. He clinically approves. And then he comes back to you at the hospitalist who was caring for him before. This hospital has incredible continuity of care. And oh, they find you. There's a bed where you are. And um, how would you, I'm just curious, how would you take over this phenobarb taper on the floor? Yeah. And it's a great question. So, and I think it's worth knowing, like we call it a taper, but like the 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 idea behind it is actually that you're 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 maintaining the blood levels of phenobarb for five days, usually is how long the taper is. And so you're giving someone this big load of 10 to 15 mg per keg. Phenobarb is like a, a linearly pharmacokinetic. I hope that statement actually made sense. But basically, like, there's a linear relationship between the dose you give and the level in someone's blood. That basic, most people uh, get like one and a half, whatever the blood units of phenobarb is for for the phenobarb load. And so you can you have like a uh, a regular and consistent level that you can get for the load you give, and then the taper maintains them at that level. So if the load worked, the taper just maintains them at the same level for five days while they're going through the high risk period for alcohol withdrawal and really hopefully prevents them from ever getting significant symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. That being said, I think we all know this in all of medicine, there's no one size fits all for everybody, right? And so like, if someone gets loaded, they they may still have symptoms and there might be another person that gets loaded and it might be a little bit too much for them. And so I'd say like, if you load someone and it looks like they're still having symptoms and you f- assess them personally and you think that they're consistent with alcohol withdrawal, they might need a little bit more phenobarb or some other adjunct of medications. Um, and so like, I just don't want people to think that like a load and a taper is always the right, is always perfect for everybody. Like you need to treat the person that's sitting in front of you and you need a personalized treatment to them too. And so some people may need a little bit more phenobarb or other adjunctive medications too. I think you kind of hinted at this, but, um, I'm realizing that we didn't really talk about kind of the timeline of alcohol withdrawal, um, when we were kind of defining it, um, and thinking about kind of how that relates to how we're managing someone in the hospital. Um, and when we're thinking of like discharge planning and adjusting our, um, whatever treatment plan we've made, um, as they're hopefully improving, um, what are kind of your thoughts on how do you approach that? Yeah, I think the timeline is always important to know because it kind of guides you on, do you think someone's about to get better, probably still not peaking yet in terms of their symptoms and they're already looking not good. And so you're really worried. And so, so I think alcohol withdrawal symptoms can start as little as six hours, six, eight hours after someone's last drink. Um, The thing that honestly peaks first is one of the scary symptoms is alcohol withdrawal seizures, which is probably why if you think back to it, you've probably seen a lot of people who present to the ED with an alcohol withdrawal seizure and then get admitted Um, because that's one of the first presentations of their symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. And that's why, again, that can be a good marker for the people that you're really scared are going to have more seizures or going to have DTs. You're more like uh, minor or moderate symptoms. And again, that's like tremors, anxiety, diaphoresis, the things that make you uncomfortable but aren't particularly scary, usually start to pick up pretty early and kind of peak in the first kind of couple of one to two days and then kind of hopefully tail off. But if someone's having more severe alcohol withdrawal and that's delirium tremens stuff that usually doesn't pick up until like day two or day three. And that can carry out until like five to seven days, I'd say. And and when you're having more severe alcohol withdrawal, those other symptoms, the tremors, agitation, diaphoresis, all that kind of stuff kind of comes along with it for the whole five to seven day course too. So to sort of summarize day one, sort of six hours from last drink to sort of day three, those are probably the days where you're at the highest risk of some of the most severe symptoms. Those seizures tend to peak a little bit early, but you're probably not fully out of the window until you hit um, that time. And that, I agree. I think you really do have to taper and adjust this to the person in front of you because there are there are outliers and we have to use our clinical decision to make sure like patients stay safe. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think it's worth saying like the, the DTs, like the onset is usually two to three days, but they like can last much longer too. And so like, yeah, but yeah, I agree. You, I mean, like everything, personalize your treatment to the person sitting in front of you. And given that that those symptoms, like the DT symptoms, would peak later in the course. Is that something that, like, if someone's feeling great on day two, are you not discharging them from the hospital? Are you worried about discharging them from the hospital um, because they're kind of still within that 72-hour period? I feel like I've heard that conversation come up a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. I think it's, like, it's dependent dependent on the story and so it's like if if someone's like in the hospital hasn't drank now for two three days has received no benzodiazepines and their whatever symptom score you're using is low and they're not hypertensive they're not tachycardic they look great not like someone's doing doing great doing great doing great and then all of a sudden at like 48 hours they're like oh shit i'm in dts and it comes out of nowhere it's it's more like someone is having like symptoms and they're not looking so good and then at like 48 to 72 hours the symptoms continue to get worse and they develop these Again, deep delirium tremens, the autonomic hyperactivity, the delirium. And so like if you're monitoring someone in the hospital and you're actually like seeing them every day, it generally shouldn't be a surprise to you that like the their delirium tremens is coming. Like they're looking sick or they're getting a ton of benzos or those are the people that are, that you should like, again, your ear should poke up and you'd be like, okay, like do I, I need to be worried about this and this person needs to stay in the hospital. All right, so let's say that he wasn't actually getting better in the ICU and was still doing pretty terribly. Are there other medications that you might reach for on top of the phenobarb or the benzodiazepine um, in an ICU level setting to help manage his alcohol withdrawal? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great question. And I'll say a, a, another plug that I'm not an ICU doctor <laughs> and I have never been and I I am um, not smart enough to be one. So um I, I I don't personally practice. I, I do get consults there, right, as an addiction med consult doc, but I don't practice in the ICU a ton. And so, but I would think when, when I'm seeing someone in the ICU who is still not doing well, again, I'm like wondering, like, what are they being treated with now? Like, do we need to change, if they're on benzodiazepines, do we need to change it or go up on the intensity? Like there, I know there are some protocols where people go wind up on like benzodiazepine drips instead, um, or do we need to switch to something like phenobarb if they're on benzos? Or if they're getting intubated, are you going to use something that's probably, I think, is active on the GABA receptor too, like propofol as a sedating agent when, when you're intubated or a benzodiazepine drip or something like that. But if 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 you're you feel like your kind of baseline GABA ergic medication is going okay and you just want to add something, I think there is some emerging data for like dexmedetomidine as an adjunctive medication. And I think it's worth noting, right? That is an adjunctive medication. And so like you should should be on an act a medication that's active at the GABA receptor, the thing that's and the glutamate receptor may be the thing that's causing the seizures and the scary stuff. Um, Dexmedetomidine is an alpha two agonist, and so it hopefully like brings down the agitation and kind of the autonomic hyperactivity, and so it can help with that regard. I think um, it's usually only available in ICUs or step down units, is my understanding. But again, I don't work in ICUs or step down units very much, but. That's the adjunctive med I think about a lot. And then I think antipsychotics are the other one that I think are used often. I think antipsychotics for people that are agitated are also have their place. But again, knowing they're not treating the underlying cause of the alcohol withdrawal, they're treating the symptom. And so make sure you're treating the underlying cause as well when you're adding these adjunctive medications. I feel like that's a good rule of thumb for all medicine. Like make sure you're treating the underlying cause. Well, Cause. That's yeah. the that is the correct answer. Treat Don't ask me the details. <laughs> yeah. um, and luckily, we have done that again. We're gonna go. We're gonna go back to the floor. Fast forward to the future. I know we did a little bit of time jumping here, but um, now let's say it's like day six in the hospital, and the patient overall is is doing better. Their CWA scores are better, but they're still like they're still scoring on their CWA consistently, like kind of six to eight. Again, and it's been day six since their last drink. So what are your thoughts about this? Does this person still need medication to help with alcohol withdrawal? Could there be something else going on? The same thing that uh, I think I always say is like, look at the patient in front of you. And so like, don't just rely on a symptom score because it is nonspecific, right? And so like, if they're looking well, otherwise they've gone through their alcohol withdrawal course, they're not hypertensive or tachycardic anymore, 
like look at what are the components of the CWA score that they're scoring for, or like what is the reason that you're that someone is still worried that they're in alcohol withdrawal? Is it are they just scoring for anxiety mostly? Are they scoring for tremor, but they have a baseline essential tremor? Like look into what's going on. We worry about acute alcohol withdrawal because it's the risk of stuff, morbidity and mortality, right? From the scary stuff that we're talking about. But it's also worth knowing that like people don't magically feel like a million bucks at the end of this like seven day course of alcohol withdrawal, right? Like uh, they're still kind of out of whack. They're not, that seesaw is not back completely to normal. And so like, they're still going to probably be more anxious than their baseline and feel unwell. And so just because they're scoring for anxiety and just because we don't need to maybe use benzodiazepines when they're getting towards the end of their course doesn't mean they're not having real symptoms that we should be addressing too. And so it's like, look at the person in front of you, kind of reevaluate things. If they're getting towards the end of the course and you don't feel like benzodiazepines are appropriate anymore because they're just scoring for things that maybe aren't acute alcohol withdrawal, still think about how do I address this to help them otherwise too. Since it's day six and they're probably feeling better, right? Like another plug for addressing alcohol use disorder, right? Not the best time to address alcohol use disorder when you're phenobar bloating them and they're on their way to the ICU because they're probably not going to be able to have that conversation with you. But same as kind of we talked about in the endocarditis episode, right? Getting an iterative history and kind of giving iterative recommendations, like giving them when someone is ready and able to give you the history and giving them recommendations when they're ready and able to hear them. And so like, you should be talking to them about treatments for alcohol use disorder, whether that's evidence-based medications like naltrexone, acamprosate, disulfiram for select people. And a big plug to the great episode, with Dr. Alyssa Peterkin, now pronouncing her name right, unlike before, but who did our, our, our alcohol use disorder meds episode last season, which is a great listen. And so if you want more info on that, I would definitely check it out. Because we are terrible at prescribing these meds, so we sh- we need to get better about it. Because we see alcohol withdrawal all the time. This has That's been incredible, Sean. This is just a whirlwind tour of alcohol withdrawal 101, and I hope everybody listening, you know, feels much more comfortable and confident in in treating, you know, our patients. So I think it's about time to wrap up. Do you have any take home points for our audience? Yeah, I think my big take home points are like use the pathophysiology to help guide your treatment a little bit. And so like, no, alcohol is predominantly GABA. And so when your body gets used to it, you tamp down your GABA, but upregulate your glutamate. That's what causes the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. And that's what we're treating. There are really evidence-based treatments for alcohol withdrawal, predominantly benzodiazepines, but also I think emerging is phenobarbital or a barbiturate. Um, And so make sure those should be part of your medication regimens. In general, I think using symptom-triggered therapy is still first line for people, particularly that are kind of uh, not at super high risk for for scary, severe alcohol withdrawal. Um, But if someone is at, make sure you're triaging, and if someone is at high risk for severe alcohol withdrawal, and that's they've had scary, severe alcohol withdrawal before, think about adding some fixed treatment or front-loading of a benzodiazepine or using phenobarbital instead. And then address the underlying the underlying chronic disease of alcohol use disorder, right? Alcohol withdrawal is a symptom of a chronic disease. If we're not addressing the chronic disease, we're not doing our jobs as doctors. And so make sure you're talking to people about this and offering them evidence-based treatment. Any other things that you'd like to plug? Again, like the ASAM, ASAM came out with alcohol withdrawal guidelines back in 2020, and they have a pocket guideline too. That's like, I don't know if it really fits in your pocket. It's pretty long, (laughs) even the pocket guideline, but but I think it's like it's a good summary of their recommendations and has some like overviews of different different types of treatment options and things like that that I think is worth taking a look at if uh, if you get the opportunity. All right. Well, this has been great, Sean. Thanks. Th- thanks so much for letting us um, punch you in our expert seat. And thanks to everybody listening. Yay. Thanks okay. for having me. This was fun and weird being on the other side of it. <laughs> And we will be back with our lightning round. All right, Sean, this is the lightning round. We're going to ask you some rapid fire questions to get to know you better. Although we, and luckily our guests, probably already know you pretty well. Um, This week we're turning the tables and we're having Sean as our content expert. So instead of a one-liner, Sean, what is your pick of the week? Oh, man, I was not prepared for that. I was expecting to do a one-liner. I was like, Sean, it's in the script. Age. <laughs> Is it? Well, I didn't read the script, so I'm pre- clearly a better host than guest. Uh, Don't give away our my secrets. Pick the, <laughs> my pick of the week. What have I been really into? Uh, other than crappy TV, 
Mm, we'll take crappy really, TV. I'm really like, uh, there's a book that just came out that I am ordering called Whiteout. That's about how, I think it's about kind of uh, the racist undertones to the opioid epidemic and how it really impacts minoritized communities differently that I'm excited to get into at some point soon when I have a week off from consult service, which is very few and far between. But can I borrow the book from you when you're done reading it? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. As always. <laughs> Audience, this is what we do as as per usual. I am borrowing one of Sean's books. So um Zena, do you have a pick of the week? Anything that you're Ooh. stoked about? Uh, this isn't really, this is kind of a sad pick of the week. I've been on ICU nights and, um, have discovered the magical powers of Celsius, which is a caffeinated seltzer beverage. Ooh. Um, it's an obscene amount of caffeine and I don't really recommend it, but it has gotten me through many a night. I think I'm having heart palpitations just thinking about <laughs> a yeah. caffeine yeah. surge. I can barely handle like a Red Bull. Yeah. It's uh, not for the faint of heart, for sure. Yeah, I get like, sometimes caffeine goes good for me and sometimes it just hits me really hard and I get like real antsy and I'm like, why do I feel this way? <laughs> but I'm and then sure it turns that into, that seltzer w- would do that. It goes from well, antsy to anxiety. It's stocked in the SRC fridges, so I'm waiting for you. Uh, uh-oh, <laughs> hard pass. Great. This has been another episode of our Curbsiders mini-series, The Curbsiders Addiction Medicine. Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com backslash addiction. And we're committed, as always, to give you high-value practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we would love your feedback. Tell us what you love, what you hate, what we can do better. So don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review our show on Apple Podcasts or contact us at curbsidersaddictionmed at gmail.com. Special thanks to Dr. Matt Watto and Dr. Paul Williams for their support in this project, as well as ACAM. Be sure to learn more about their organization at acaam.org. A special thank for always to our entire team who makes these episodes possible, including all of our producers and our associate editors. And we are really thankful to have our episodes um, produced and edited by the team at Pop Paste. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME credit for all healthcare professionals at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. All you have to do is create an account. Until next time, uh, I'm Dr. Carolyn Chan. And I'm Dr. Zena Huxley-Raker. Thank you for joining us today and letting us bring you some addiction medicine pearls. Mm-hmm.